Hey folks, and welcome to uh, this week's lesson on cinematography. Um, this is uh, the first part of a lesson on cinematography. Um, what does the cinematography refer to? Refer to? Refers to affordances of and choices made by the camera. If mise-en-scene are the things in front of the camera, the space that is recorded, cinematography entails what you do with the camera itself. Um, in this um, particular week, um, we're going to focus on lenses, um, focal length and depth of field, framing, um, including the concepts of on and off screen space, and um, framing, including things like camera angle and distance. Um, in this uh, lesson, we're only going to do focal length and depth of field. So what do I mean by focal length? Um, focal length simply refers to um, the amount of space captured by um, a lens. A lens is a particular um, uh, device, um, like the lenses on our eyes, that manipulates um, the uh, range of space. So when we talk about film studies, uh, use of lenses, we can talk about wide, normal, or telephoto lenses. Notice what we have here are three identical spaces with the same human figure captured by uh, the camera, but the spaces behind the human figure should look rather different. A wide angle lens, as you can see on the left side of the screen, captures a vast amount of space. The telephoto on the right side of the screen captures far less space, and the normal is somewhere in between. In this class, I don't need you to, to uh, be able to say, name the millimeter length for, um, for, for lenses. I just want you to know the difference between wide, normal, and telephoto. Um, so once again, we have wide angle, expansive space, and telephoto, limited space. Um, to give you another example, one way you can think about this is to think about um, something like in baseball, when you're watching um, the pitcher's mound, it doesn't look like there's a lot of space captured in that particular camera angle when you're watching a baseball game on television between the batter and the pitcher. That's because there's a telephoto lens being used. It compresses space. But when you have a wide angle lens, notice how much space seems to be captured between this figure in the foreground and the figure in the background. A normal lens length will bring in that distance, and a telephoto lens will compress that distance. These things can be difficult to notice at first, but once you get in the hang of it, um, you can start to realize that every single shot, um, even if you didn't think about it, contains an element of lens length that is re responsible for how the image looks. Um, we can look at a little example of this uh, in a clip from uh, the Royal Tenenbaums. Wes Anderson is a director who loves to use wide-angle lenses. Why does he love to use them? Well, let's just pause for a moment. Um, because he really enjoys uh, be using detailed mise-en-scene that has very, very deliberate um, aesthetic choices and design, something that seems as if it's not quite real out of a picture book. How do I know this is a uh, uh, wide-angle lens shot? Well, one clue is that I have this bowed line, right? I know intuitively that this line of this sign should be straight, but a wide-angle lens tends to bow out um, straight angles. And let's watch some other evidence of this. Remember, in this case, I mostly want you to be able to identify things um, to enhance um, your knowledge of what you're seeing. You can still see the bowed angles um, even with the railing uh, that is behind the characters there. It's a little bit harder to see in that shot, but here it's quite pronounced, right? Um, notice the way in which the line um, continued by the two uh, buses creates a bowed angle, even though it's supposed to be straight. Uh, the director wants to have a nice, huge, wide-angle image. So I think that's enough. Uh, for us there. Um, so once again, this is a wide angle composition. Not all of the images in a Wes Anderson film are wide angle, but a lot of them are, especially those that give us uh, a nice big picture um, of an open space. Now I want us to look at an example of telephoto, but I want to do a little bit of analysis of it. Um, this is one of the kind of most canonized and clever uses of telephoto lens to express something about a character's state. And I'll let this one play, um, play out and then uh, comment on it.
Okay, so to give you a bit of context for what's going on in this clip, this is the film The Graduate, which is a kind of subversive uh, romantic comedy. Uh, subversive because it's clearly paying homage to the tradition of romantic comedy, but it tries to subvert uh, a lot of the expectations we have with uh, the genre. And what's happening here is a quite cliched um, part of a romantic comedy story is toward the end of the film, our protagonist is realizing that he wants to proclaim his love to a woman who is getting married on that day. So what does he do? Well, he tries, tries to get to the wedding as quickly as possible to uh, stop her from marrying this man and proclaim his love for her, which in fact he does, but with a twist. But before what happens, um, it's interesting to note that this is how it's depicted. You can already tell that there's a way in which this film tries to de uh, or tries to take out some of the drama that we want to associate with this kind of scene. That's very apparent here, right? When the music that's supposed to be amplifying our excitement is starting to peter out, just as uh, the gas in his car um, is starting to peter out. But the thing that I want to draw your attention to is what happens after he gets out of the car and starts to run, which in an ordinary romantic comedy might be heightened with a sense of, uh, of excitement, um, of dynamism. But notice when we cut to this angle, this is a telephoto lens that is compressing the space. Um, so what it's doing is almost making it look as if he's running in place de-emphasizing the, the speed and dynamism um, and excitement of his, uh, of his attempt to stop the wedding and kind of getting us to reflect upon this cliche by taking out all of the elements that, uh, that reinforce its excitement. Um, a really great example of how to use lens length in order to, compa uh, to convey some kind of point, some kind of political uh, point in this film. So once again, this was telephoto and this was uh, wide angle. Um, so let's talk about uh, focus and depth of field. Um, first thing I want to do is just give you a, uh, an important distinction that's easy to miss. Um, in your reading, you're going to see a lot of uses of the term depth of field. But it's important to know that depth of field is not the same thing as deep space. What is depth of field? It's the range of possibilities, deep or shallow, in which objects can be in focus. What is deep space? It's the spatial arrangement of a shot that emphasizes depth. Um, importantly, a uh, deep space shot or a, a deep focus shot needs to be deep space, but you can have a deep space shot that is not uh, deep focus. Why do I know this is deep space? Because I can imagine that there's a lot of space covered by the, uh, the, the camera. Um, why do I know it's deep, uh, not deep focus, but shallow focus? Because only a shallow amount of the uh, frame is in focus. The rest of this is clearly out of focus. This, however, from Citizen Kane is both deep space and deep focus. Why is it deep space? Because there's a lot of space on the Z axis that is covered with respect to the space that's uh, captured and respect, with respect to the camera's position. Why is it deep focus? Because both this person and that person are clearly in focus. Um, how do we see this in the film that we watched, um, A Man Escaped? Well, uh, on the left, what we have is a deep space, deep focus composition, a lot of space on this z-axis composition uh, being covered, and uh, both figures in the foreground and background are in focus. However, notice the difference between our foreground character and a background character. Um, Fontaine, our protagonist, is nice and, and crisply in focus, but this background character is not. That's a deep space, shallow focus. What about shallow space? Shallow space simply refers to um, a composition that doesn't have a lot of z-axis space. Um, I can't see beyond this encumbrance, this wall, uh, or this floor. That's why it's a shallow space composition. Um, so that's kind of just the technical stuff. Why don't we talk a little bit about some expressive possibilities that we can make with deep, deep focus cinematography. Best Years of Our Lives contains one of the great sequences of deep focus cinematography. Um, I'm going to show it to you in its entirety. All you need to know here is that this is a story about three men who come home from the war. Um, and it's a kind of uh, drama about how their lives unfold and how they readjust to their, to their lives after the war. 
in the sequence that you'll see uh, Dana Andrews' character, uh, who has been dating the daughter of Frederick March's character, has a confrontation um, with him in which Frederick March asks da Dana Andrews to stop dating his daughter, something that Dana Andrews doesn't want to do, but is willing to do anyway. And he'll go to the phone booth to make a phone call to presumably end the relationship uh, with his daughter. And I want you to pay attention to how that phone call is framed and how our attention to it is manipulated throughout the sequence. up and tell us so. That satisfy you? Yeah. Anything else on your mind? No. Okay, chum. So long. So long, Fred. The drinks are on me. So I'm going to pause it right now just so I can set up what's going to happen so you can pay attention. Notice right now that a third character, our other main character, uh, Homer Parrish, has entered the bar. Now, if you look to the left, you'll see that Dana Stevens' character is doing the important action um, of, of this sequence. He is making the call, um, presumably to end the relationship in order to please the father. And I want you to try to track the location of this particular image as we watch. This is the dominant composition of this sequence, and it's going to hold for a good amount of time. So I just want to pause right there. Now what we have here is a very complex image. It's a deep focus uh, and deep space image. It's deep space, of course, because there's a lot of space covered in the z-axis, and it's deep focus because Dana Stevens' character is sharply um, in focus just as much as our foreground characters are. But what we're doing here is that the director and the cinematographer are allowing us to, uh, to choose between who we're going to pay attention to. And this is really significant because our attention is going to want to fixate on the action in the foreground, which is a kind of spectacle um, in a sense. And, uh, but, the, but the narrative drive, the, the most important narrative information, is actually happening in this tiny little box. So it means something when we um, move our attention towards that little box. I hope you notice that when these men at the bar turn around, that also encourages us to look here. But then Frederick March's character, looking at Dana Stevens' character, might compel us to move our attention over here. It's a very complex network of attention. This cut-in, of course, is, 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 is asking us, if we missed it, um, to say, hey, realize there's something happening over Homer Parrish's uh, shoulder. So now what we have here is a scene that really utilizes what a lot of film theorists would say were the primary motivations and, and possibilities of deep focus cinematography. Um, and think about how deep focus cinematography goes against the um, normativization of editing, right? Um, there was very little editing that was telling us to go back and forth between our attention on Dana Stevens and our attention on Homer Parrish. Um, uh, the idea here is that deep focus and a long take gives us the choice of where to look. Now a few more terms. A shallow focus, racking focus, and bokeh effects. Um, so 
when we have effects like this in Queen Victoria from 2009, um, when uh, within one shot um, an object's uh, focus uh, changes to another object's focus, we can generally call that racking focus. Um, and the kind of uh, effects that happen, these kind of circles um, that are the result of very, very shallow focus, we generally can call bokeh effects. Um, likely won't test you on bokeh effects. It's just uh, something that is useful to know. Um, let's look at an expressive use of racking focus. Once again, from The Graduate, a film that uses a lot of tele uh, telephoto uh, and cinematographic techniques. This is a sequence in which um, that very woman that our protagonist uh, rushes to proclaim his love to um, uh, learns a dark secret about the protagonist, which is that um, throughout the beginning of the film, he's been having an affair with her mother. And notice the way in which uh, rack focus um, emphasizes something important here. That woman, that older woman that I told you about? You mean that Yes, one? the married woman. That wasn't just some woman. What are you telling me? Benjamin, will you just tell me what this is all about? Okay, a very small change, I mean a very small um, little note here, but I want you just to think about um, what wasn't done, which would have been a conventional quick rack focus, but what was done was to take the conventional thing and to stretch it out, to elongate, to elongate it over a period of say 10, 12, 13 seconds. Right? And we feel the length of those seconds as if they almost correspond to the slow realization of what's happening right now. Right? Um, that there is this time it takes for this character and for us as spectators to realize a momentous truth. And that is expressed purely, in a sense, through a cinematographic choice. Um, Going back to a few terms that I want you to know, aspect ratio um, simply refers to the ratio between the length and width of a screen frame. Uh, aspect ratio is an important part of the development of film. We're all used to widescreen aspect ratios, but that wasn't always the case. Um, right now you're looking at an image that is a widescreen aspect ratio, but for a long time, uh, academy, academy ratio, which is 1.33 to one, was the standard. So let's just make sure we know the differences between them. And there are a number of aspect ratios, but there are three main ones that I think are important to know. The first one, once again, is called Academy Ratio. It was established in 1932, um, and it's a 1.33 to one. You look at a 30s or 40s a Hollywood film, it'll likely be in that aspect ratio. Um, next up from that is widescreen. Um, widescreen is fairly common. Uh, today, it's a 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio. Um, these widescreen ratios, um, widescreen and uh, CinemaScope, were emerging in the 1950s. Why? As a way to um, make cinema seem special with respect to the rising popularity of television. Television was a square, and if cinema wanted to be different and to get people into theaters, it used this new widescreen as a way to um, sell its own uh, uniqueness as a medium. Um, so we have this widescreen aspect ratio and CinemaScope um, uh, ratio, 2.35 to 1, which we still use today in a lot of films, is uh, usually considered the, the, the widest that you'll go in a standard framing. Um, what have we seen so far? We've watched two films um, in the first two weeks that were, uh, or the first two units that were widescreen, 1.85 to 1. But I want you to also keep in mind that a film like Gravity, which we'll watch later, is a more or less a CinemaScope frame. Um, and the film that we watched for this week, Man Escaped, is an Academy ratio. And just think about how different the experiences of those films are and how important the aspect ratios are to conveying those experiences, right? Gravity is a film that's immersive. It wants you to feel as if you're in a space. So it makes sense to make that space almost consistent with the way that our eyes perceive space, which is a very wide um, picture. A Man Escaped, however, which is happening at a time in which you can go beyond um, uh, academy ratio is choosing to keep things in the narrow aspect ratio. And it makes sense given that this is a very minimalist film. Robert Bresson is a minimalist filmmaker and there's a very different experience to have an image like this 
from an image like this, if we imagine the film to being an academy ratio. It's a small thing, um, but I do think something about the sense of confinement in this film is reinforced by the squarish aspect ratio. Okay, that's it for today. Next time we'll be looking at off-screen space, and we'll be looking in particular at the film uh, A Man Escaped. Thanks.